Good morning, everyone. I am Adeline Oi, Director Asia of Art Basel. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. I know it's rainy and it's 10 o'clock and um, staying in bed might be a better idea. But anyway, um, welcome to the very, very first of our conversation and salon series this year. As you know, we've been very greedy with the panels this year and we've packed in 25 talks. And uh, to start off this morning, and to start off actually the entire series, is a talk on cities on the move. Um, this panel is particularly um, meaningful and emotional, and sort of, I'm truly invested in this one. I will just admit this because a number of these people here have been friends and mentors of mine for the past 20 years. And, um, and this iconic exhibition, we think, is really, you know, it's really worth revisiting after 20 years because. Han Ru and Hans Ulrich's writing, I think, you know, about Asia's development, the rapid changes, I think that's still very much present in this part of the world. And almost, I think they're quite oracle-like in terms of their writing. So um, without further ado, I'm going to pass this mic on to our two, excuse me, our two original curators, Hans Ulrich Orbris, Han Ho Han Ru, and I'll let them take it away. Thank you, Adeline. Thank you so much. Uh, we're very grateful uh, for this invitation to you, to Mark, to Stephanie, to Louise, and the uh, amazing team here. And of course, to our uh, extraordinary speaker we're going to introduce in a minute. Hanru and I thought maybe we give you a little bit of context first to tell you a few stories about how this all started uh, 20 years ago. And um, uh, actually, in a way, everything started with the Vienna Secession, but everything even started before that because uh, it was actually more or less 25 years ago that we 27. met. 27. Exactly, with Han Ru. Uh, and of course, it had a lot to do with this extraordinary generation of uh, artists and curators moving to France after 89. And uh, Han Ru and I met at the very beginning uh, uh, of basically both our, our work and sort of developed a five year conversation, which then somehow lead up to, uh, uh, to Cities on the Move. We felt uh, that this invitation from the secession was a great opportunity to actually do an exhibition on, um, on Asian art. And maybe I'm gonna read you here a very short extract um, from uh, our preface from the time, which somehow gives you a little bit of a summary of what the show was about. Cities on the Move is the first joint presentation of art and architecture from Asian cities in Europe. The exhibition endeavors to shed some light on the incredibly dynamic architecture and art scenes of these cities, which are mostly unknown in Europe, and we'll try to introduce more than 100 different positions and points of view to the European audience. Recurrent themes are density, growth, complexity, connectivity, speed, traffic, dislocation, migration, homelessness, and ecology. That was the kind of list you know, of the themes we wanted to address with that show. The different positions make clear that there is no such thing as a nation city, but that there are manifold heterogeneous concepts of the city. And that actually, from the very beginning, led us to the idea, because we traveled and made a very open research with uh, Han Ru um, uh, through many Asian cities, and didn't want to have this kind of a priori idea that we had an idea, and then you know, art would illustrate this idea, which mostly always leads to bad group shows. Um, but we actually wanted to do it the other way around, and really listen, and look, and look, and look, and listen. And little by little, we realized that wherever we went, artists and architects equally, were of course deeply affected and impacted by the amazing mutation of cities. Uh, I will always remember Han Ru when we went to your hometown, to Guangzhou, and met your parents. Um, <laughs> you explained to me that six months after not visiting the city, you barely found your house. Absolutely. Because the city had changed so much. So this incredible acceleration of urban mutation, we wanted to make that as a catalyst for the show and decided to make the exhibition into a city. So that actually the exhibition became a performative space. Um, and it wouldn't have a master plan. So we, in a way, let it grow and grow uh, and evolve. And we never really had a closed artist list. That I must say, it had a lot to do with Katrin Bromberg and the secession and their amazing openness, because they just let us do. I think many institutions would have got very scared. Um, and uh, I mean, still a day before the opening, we invited artists. Uh, and you know, little by little, more and more artists arrived at the secession. And we didn't really have um, you know, a master plan. We always had an architect for each incarnation of the show. So it was Chang Yong Ho, the architect from Beijing, who actually you know, gave a display feature to the show later on 
It was already Sharon and Graham Kohlhaas. She gave Obama many other architects. And that was somehow the, 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 you know, the structure. But then around this structure, an evolving exhibition freely articulated itself. We also felt from the very beginning that it was important to address the topic of uh, globalization. I think we um, realized in the 90s that uh, this was not the first time the world faced uh, globalization. I mean, there was a globalization in previous centuries and millennia, but this was a very extreme, also violent period of globalization. Uh, we read a lot of Eduard Glissant and realized that in a way, you know, we needed to address the homogenizing forces of globalization and resist them, and at the same time, you know, not fall into a backlash against this great potential of global dialogue, hence the idea of mondialité, you know, to do an exhibition which will produce global dialogue and at the same time, you know, produce also difference, not homogenize. And that was really, in a way, the principle why we also wanted the exhibition to change and sprawl. We hated this idea of the exhibition becoming a touring show. And it was actually kind of funny because, of course, the exhibition grew, so the budget grew, and we were at the end of the day in a situation where the secession had to tour the exhibition to make the money back, because otherwise the exhibition would have been ruined. I mean, the, the secession would have been ruined, be ruined, and it would have been a bad, you know, a bad thing, and a, an artist run space for more than a century, we didn't want to ruin that space. So Han Ru and I said, let's tour it like crazy to make all the money back for the great secession. But then we thought, you know, if we tour it as a package, that's kind of, I remember we had a conversation with Han Ru and we thought, that's like McDonald's. We can't sort of just impose an exhibition to the next city in a homogenized way. No, we need to listen, to learn, to listen. And that's why we came up with this idea, this novel idea of an exhibition format which from each city to city would uh, evolve. The research was incredibly fascinating and uh, intense. Um, I remember we came to Hong Kong exactly 20 years ago, uh, and uh, I was at that time in a sort of a phase where I didn't want to sleep, uh, and there wasn't enough money for Han Ru and me. The secession couldn't pay for two hotel rooms, so there was a huge problem, you know, because I didn't want to sleep, and Han Ru wanted to sleep. Um, so also, um, it was uh, quite extraordinary because, of course, in a way, it was really intense because for weeks and weeks, you know, we it's would just tour. It's never good to be older. Exactly. So and then the title, and then I hand over to Han Ru, the title, we had until the last moment a really terrible title. Uh, we wanted to talk about the soaring cities uh, and the soaring economies. And then, of course, a few weeks before the opening, the uh, Asian economies crashed. So luckily, you know, we had not chosen that as a title because it would have been a big you know, contradiction. And so we, we a few, really the day when it went to print, came up with this idea of cities on the move. Yeah, and and because Ellen actually sent us a message saying that your title is really colonial. So we have to think about something else. And then we read Massimo Cacciari, uh, the philosopher term mayor in Venice, and he had written a text on Città in Movimento. So we kind of got inspired to call this uh, cities on the move. So these are a few uh, ideas, but obviously today we will listen to the artists and their memories, and then I'll hand over yeah, to Maybe Hanru. I just add a few things. Uh, of course, it, uh, uh, the Cities on the Move, uh, step one, uh, started with the uh, secession to celebrate the 100 years of uh, that great institution. But there was quite a, uh, let's say, a, a, um, far seeing um, a vision of the institution trying to not only to look at its own history of the last 100 years, but really look forward uh, to the change of the uh, creativity in general, not only, and also contemporary art and, and architecture in particular uh, uh, in the world. And that is, at the time, um, Asia Pacific. That was the future. Um, so um, very quickly, they wanted to, you know, uh, to develop some um, you know, uh, projections on what happens there, and then it happens at Han Ruish, uh, and me, we, we are lucky to be able to, to work with this institution to really develop these. And the step one, was, as Han Ruish said, it was supposed to be only for the secession. But very quickly, um, for the reason of, of course, making the money back, but especially for the reason that, the reason that perhaps, uh, this project really provoked a thought on you know, what the future would be. So some other uh, institutions share the same desire to embrace the future. So they came to us to try to have this uh, project touring. And, and um, so it actually went 
the all of Europe, not only Europe, um, but it, it went to uh, Bordeaux in France and then uh, PS1 in New York and then back to Europe. Um, uh, I don't know if it's Europe anymore, it's the UK, um, London, and of course Denmark, uh, and then uh, and Helsinki, but in between, I went back to uh, Thailand, to Bangkok. Um, and to Bangkok, uh, uh, it was not an exhibition, it, was, it became a kind of mobilization of the local uh, community of crea creation. So um, it became um, a kind of a urban festival happening in, I don't know, 50, 60 different venues. And uh, within a month, uh, really uh, all kinds of events um, uh, happened. So, um, it doesn't make sense to bring the exhibition back to Bangkok, but really use the, the idea, uh, use the, um, um, this project as a mobi mobilization of the, uh, the energy and to really uh, create a, a momentum in the city. So that was uh, really the model. And, and um, so Cities on the Move, it's not really an exhibition, but really it is um, a process of engaging with uh, all kind of um, utopian and critical uh, 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 visions of what uh, was happening at the time. And I think this, um, these themes are still uh, valid today. It becomes even more urgent. Many questions that we initiated uh, the discussion at the time become even more urgent today. And especially the, um, the question of, uh, you know, uh, urban development, all the consequences, and and also I think has to do with what kind of art, uh, what kind of artistic um, uh, uh, actions that one should take in this context. Uh, so uh, the, the irony is actually we talk about this in the in the uh, art fair, which is quite ironical because um, I think the whole idea of cities on the move is all about. Uh, all kind of creative interventions beyond the art market. Because at the time there was no really a market uh, for contemporary art. Um, but in the, in the meantime, there was a, also a necessity, I think this necessity is still going on, um, to emphasize the utopian, uh, uh, the utopian dimension of creation, especially things happening in process, the immaterial, the performative, the, the things that you cannot uh, stop, you cannot uh, freeze and, and transform into materials. So that is really uh, a, I think it remains a huge challenge today, uh, especially in the time that when the market becomes uh, much more uh, uh, kind of uh, powerful and shaping what the artists are doing. I think today it's time to come back to discuss this. So, Cities on the move, it's all about on the move. And actually, uh, of course, what Hanru mentions, it's also all about process, and it allowed uh, the artist, you know, over three or four years to meet again and again uh, in different, you know, incarnations of the exhibition and let the process evolve. So many of the artists actually worked on, they didn't work on pieces in that sense. It was this idea of a finite piece, but they worked on evolving situations, and so it was also this idea that we all had time, it liberated time to work on something. And as Andrew said, we soon realized, you know, that the topic was so vast and so immense that we kind of couldn't, you know, just solve it with one exhibition. It needed an ongoing uh, investigation and it needed also many exhibitions within the exhibition. It's also this idea, we talked a lot with Andrew about Russia Matrushkas, this idea of the show within the show. And so we had a lot of temporary autonomous zones because of course we also wanted to question this authority of the curator who sort of top down decides because in a way it's the same thing about the city. You know, when you don't have a top down urbanist, you listen, you have bottom up urbanists, you have self organization in cities. So we were very interested in inviting artists to develop their own reality and have shows within the show and artists run spaces, etc., etc. And we'll hear more about that, of course, from Ellen. Uh, and her you know, visionary space in Hong Kong, which was so fundamental. So we, uh, it's now the moment, I think, to um, hand over to our speakers and uh, asking you all to give uh, a very, very warm welcome to Wang Hoi Chung, to Adam Pao, to Xu Tan, and to Anthony Yang. Hello. 
I never actually uh, started really in the early time with um, a video touch, uh, which was 80... 86. 86, my God. So, and okay. she's still, you know, um, running this amazing... Um, actually, uh, I left the, the Lightroom video touch three years ago. Okay. So now I'm more independent artist. <coughs> and yeah. But I mean, I remember uh, when... When you both came to my office, uh, in the, in what is in Oil Street? Yeah, Oil Street. Yeah. yeah. In Oil Street, in North. Before, before the Lao Pa days. Yes, before Lao Pa. Um, so that that is actually the I would say the most exciting time uh, of video touch. Uh, we have uh, we finally have our first office. Uh, we have an uh, independent office from, from SUNY Aquasahedron. So we used to have an office attached to SUNY Aquasahedron. And that is the time when we are independent. And we have, uh, we have because we, we, we are approaching um, 97, the handover time of Hong Kong to back to China. So there are a lot of um, anxiety and uncertainty. Uh, within, uh, I think, within the, the whole city. And so we decided to um, to do some, like to collect video artwork and turn it into a compilation and a semi-archive things. So it will be, it served the two purpose. It's a compilation that can tour to different exhibition. And it's uh, also, uh, serving the purpose to archive those videos uh, so that um, people in the future can look back into the times that we have uh, before the handover. So, so we are collecting videos and uh, some of the videos were uh, very like dated, uh, like comes from the 80s when we first started the group. Uh, but some videos are uh, like more recent, like uh, within the time, the few years time of the handover. And we, I think we submit uh, a three, uh, three volumes of uh, compilation works to, to City on the Moves. Um, and each have a different um, curatorial idea in it. It was all uh, curated by me or compiled by me and um, the first one is um, Lost and Found. Uh, those videos are uh, collect uh, from friends, and those are not, um, I mean, those artists are still uh, working artists active during that time, and so we have to ask them to give us their uh, older work. And so we, some of them are actually lost, and uh, finally we find it again, so that's why we have the title Lost and found, and then there is another one um, that we call Mark Shot, and which uh, identified all the uh, active, the uh, the most active artists uh, in Hong Kong uh, during that time. And then there is the third one called Expired Memories, and it collects the the works that address um, the anxiety and also the uh, the mobility of Hong Kong uh, citizen. Uh, immigration and all that issues um, during during the 90s. So that I think that was uh, about an over an hour work that we have submitted. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it's like a show within the show. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That was the one of the prototypes that we were inspired of, um, and uh, also you know the artist rent spaces. It's really uh, also another very important inspiration for us to look at how to understand the relation between the art world, the architectural space, and the city. So for us, it was really important to uh, put to, to put forward this uh, uh, this understanding of the relationship between artists working directly from the street level, um, bringing really uh, the private. Uh, to the public and the public into the private. And that um, helps us to also to think about you know, what kind of institutional uh, context that we should create to be 
more meaningful, more unique, more original than simply uh, building the same kind of museums um, as you found in Paris, in London, and in New York, and so on. So, of course, that was that become a long discussion, and today in, we are still facing the same, you know, problematic uh, question about what kind of museums do we need here. So, of course, in Hong Kong, we are building not we, but some people, especially PD, is building a huge museum now, and that what's the future of this place, and what's the real, you know, uh, function of that place, I think it remains an open question. So, uh, 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 maybe we can uh, ask yeah. Ellen one more question about that, because I think what is interesting in relation to that is sort of the topic of uh, generosity, you know, yeah. and has to do also with what Han Ru said in the introduction, and uh, I remember, you know, in our conversation with, uh, when we visited your office, we felt this incredible generosity of you as an artist doing all this work you know, for other artists, and I mean, the other day, I had coffee here with Samson Young, you know, the amazing artist who is, uh, of course, uh, now so present in, in Hong Kong, and we represent Hong Kong in Venice, and he was saying, you know, that we really, you opened this door for him. He's a musician, and then, you know, he meets you, he meets videotage, and all of a sudden gets aware that there could be something else, and he came into art, and so I think this generosity of opening doors, it would be interesting to hear a little bit more about that, and how videotage, you know, was a, had a real mentor function also for younger artists in the city? I think it's because we, we are doing a lot of programming. I mean, we try to have this video compilation every year, so we are actually pushing people to um, give us work. And because uh, in those times, there are, um, there are very few commercial galleries, especially uh, for video. This media is a bit off the market, I would say. And, and the, not many artists are doing video work, and if they are, they probably are, I won't say lazy, but they probably are less productive than a TV producer. So um, they probably, I have to push them to, to finish a work. And, <laughs> and um, yeah, so for, in, in order to produce a compilation every year is a bit, uh, a lot of work for me, and for the office, and uh, so I have to, you know, come up with the idea and talk to them, and then follow up with that. So there is a, a bit of work there, but I'm I enjoy. Um, I mean, especially in those times, actually the whole society is really very active, and a lot of um, not a lot of um, good ideas in in the I think in the air. And um, and so I think I met Samson um, after two two thousand something two thousand and four maybe maybe or two thousand and three. That is actually um, almost the last volume of our compilation. We we have our compilation until around two thousand and three and two thousand and four, and. And so I met him when he said he, well, he introduced himself as a musician and asked me to do um, a collaboration, to do an MTV with him. But he is working on mainly classical music. So I really don't know how to do a classical music uh, MTV. Um, but I mean, it can, it can be done, but... Uh, it would take me a long time because the piece would be very long, the music piece would be very long. So, um, so I refer him to another artist who, I, actually at that time I'm working on um, a video dance piece. So um, I'm working with, a, uh, with the C City Contemporary Dance Company, CCDC in Hong Kong, and we are working on the first uh, dance video dance festival called Jumping Frame. So I'm uh, trying to commission uh, to pair up a dancer and, and video artist to do the last compilation, um, the commission work. And so I refer him to um, Chris Lau. And, uh, so he is the manager in the, in the office. And because we, we um, Video Touch is, is more or less a, a artist collective. We call ourselves an artist collective. 
So I am very happy and I also encourage our uh, manager or you know, coordinator to, to, to work on, to create apps. So, um, so I'm very happy that uh, Chris, uh, he is also a uh, designer. And uh, so Samson and Chris actually, they pair up pretty well and they become a, a duo artist group. Uh, and they won a lot of prize actually when they are performing and also uh, producing artwork together. Um, but of course, I, I, I will follow up with, uh, because Chris is in, in the office, so I will follow up with their work and give them the comment and all that. So yeah, that is the time. Yeah, uh, this generosity has been really reflected in the physical uh, presentation of the exhibition itself. Um, number one, the exhibition is really full of incredibly dense presentation of works. So you can see on the pictures that uh, in one corner you have 20 artists piling up their work together. And this is, is such an incredible uh, way to say that art is no longer kind of a, um, uh, how to say, self-expression um, without looking at the others. But really it's about the, the condition of urban density that push everyone to come together to um, not only to, uh, uh, to um, um, create the spaces for their own selves, but really for a kind of collaborative uh, uh, conversation and negotiation. So you can see really this. And then, and then the second thing is really um, a, a presentation rather than representation of existing works, but it's a presentation of uh, a working process. And that makes the exhibition, so-called exhibition, into a huge machine of production. So artists find themselves in front of the other artists and they negotiate, they produce new ideas, they, they create incredible interactions. And that involves really a kind of critical reflection on what an artist is, what a so-called uh, autonomous status of art should be. So that's, uh, I think, uh, a very interesting postmodern uh, strategy to challenge the, word, the, the question of property of art, the question of uh, uh, self-expression, the, the, the question of modernity at large. And that, I think, was really uh, something that Cities on the Move uh, put forward. And, and also, it's always been a challenge to all the institutions how to deal with that, the overlapping of images, sounds, and videos, and, you know, moving images, still images, and so on. And especially the, uh, the artists stay in the, during the whole process, stay in the, in the site. They produce things, they live there, they sometimes cook and smoke and drink together. So that was fantastic. Uh, and it was also very scary for some people from some institutions who wanted to take the exhibition to other museums. They, they literally freaked out um, by you know what they saw. Uh, um, they filmed the some people actually filmed the process of how the artist was working while well working in, on the sites. They put they brought them back to the uh, museum and discussed with their team, the director, trustee, whatever, and then they decided not to take it because it was too scary. And I think this would. Uh, Today it would be even more difficult to be accepted, but it's much more necessary to do it again. I think. Yeah, and, layering, and that, no? It's yeah. so many layers. Yeah. Absolutely, and I think that has to has a real uh, a political um, dimension into it. And of course, cities on the move also deal, dealt with uh, real politics in in all the cities in the process of uh, changing. I think Hoi Chang has the best position to talk about this because he was involved with, you know, a the democratic movement in Malaysia, in in Southeast Asia, and at the turn of the 90s, especially, you know, when in the 97, uh, that context, um, after the crisis of uh, uh, financial crisis in happening, and there was a crash of different political ideas about the future of the society that generate um, a real struggle. So uh, maybe Hoi Chang has, 
I'm sure Ho Chang is the best person to talk about that. Yeah, totally. And also, of course, Ho Chang, your piece, Seeds of Change, I think was the title, right? Uh, had a lot to do with the very strong Bonk, yeah. political dimension of, of, of art, the social contract of art. Okay, I'm just going to pick up on uh, some points by uh, Hans, Alan, and Andrew. Um, and then I will go on to whatever I have to talk about. Hans started by saying that he was at that point, uh, I'm just giving some gossips behind the scene. I hope you all don't mind. Yes, we love it. <laughs> so, you know, Hans talked about uh, not sleeping at that point. In fact, I don't think he's still sleeping because a few days ago, he sent Hanru and myself a message and told us that sleeping is harmful. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so, so, yeah, talk, I mean, just to use that as an anecdote, there was a sense of a, a maniacal sense in the 90s in Asia. Um, we had what you call Asian tigers, right, uh, in the 90s, and the bubble economy. And every city was just booming and booming and booming. The banks were giving out loans, and there were hundreds of banks. And, and when the exhibition started, it thrived on this kind of maniacal uh, progression that was happening in Asia. Um, but a couple of months just before the opening in, I think, September, was it September? Yeah, I think in July, the first economy crashed, and then another crashed, and then the, uh, the currencies fell, and bank collapsed, and there were demonstrations. So it was that kind of a, which uh, Alan talked about, that anxiety, that zeitgeist of that period, uh, where there was a sense, an utopian sense of Asia being different, and then suddenly Asia collapsed. Co uh, Korea collapsed, Malaysia, Indonesia, um, Thailand was the worst. I think Korea was bad. Uh, Taiwan was less affected, Japan as well, and Hong Kong went back to China, and uh, reformacy or reformation movement started in Malaysia and Indonesia, and a few years later, thousands were killed. So it was that kind of zeitgeist of the 90s. Second, I'm going to pick up on um, what Han Ru and Hans talked about. It was an exhibition in progress. Um, it was quite an amazing experience for an artist participating in it because it was one of the first few performative exhibitions. Now the, nowadays, the, the, the notion of performativity uh, is bantered around. But back then, in the mid-90s, it was kind of interesting because, and we were just talking about it, it was a time when we first communicated not over fax machines, but over email. The whole exhibition was done through email. There no, were no actually, fax machines. No, actually, fax machine was the main thing. There are few people who have email. Is so, it? Yeah, <laughs> so this is why the catalog was a, a collection of fax. Uh, uh, you do remember oh the yeah, catalog? Oh, yeah, remember the faxes. And, yeah. and, and the it pool. changed over the show. Yeah. At the beginning yeah. for Vienna, it was all fax. And by the time the exhibition then had reached London, right. It sort of had, so it was really that transition. Yeah. And as Han Ru said, you know, the catalog was all A4 because we got all these faxes. I, and there was no money for a graphic designer, so Han Ru and I took a night train uh, <laughs> to the publisher in Germany, to Cannes, and on that train kind of made a uh, impromptu a layout of faxes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. just one little uh, gossip about the catalog I was made. <laughs> and the, during the whole process, actually, we have our friend Chitty. Uh, who held us to collect right. all the facts. The facts were facts to my fax machine because Hans Ulrich was always traveling, so he didn't have a fixed phone, and there was no hand phone at the time. Yeah. It was no, in London, later. we have, we start having hand phone, yeah. but that was two years later. But anyway, so uh, we received all the facts pages, and I collect them and send it to, give it to Chitty, he was at, kind of, you know, put them in a file, and then, a um, few days before, a few weeks before the opening, and Hans Ulrich finally uh, found the publisher. I think we found the publisher, and then we had to go to Germany, and, and it was in Stuttgart. So we took the night train from Paris to, to uh, Stuttgart, and at the time there was no fast train, so we had to spend the night on the, on the train. And you wrote the text. And we wrote the text uh, <laughs> somewhere in between, but the, the thing is actually uh, we had to booked um, a wagon lee, which is like a room, a, a coach, with three uh, beds. And when we got in, we thought we were, would, be, uh, would be alone. 
And actually, at the last minute, there's a guy came in and who, who wanted to sleep. So we have to actually talk to him and say, well, well, we need to work and so on. He was not very happy. So we called the, the controller. The controller came and said, we gave him 100 francs and say, can you uh, find a room for this guy? Um, so he actually found a room for this guy alone, and we took over the room. And then uh, every half an hour, the controller brought coffee to us. So this is how we, when we arrived the next morning in, in Stuttgart, we had the book ready. So we went to the publisher, and two weeks later, we had the book on the table. So that was how it was made. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, no problem. Uh, yeah, so it was, uh, and what was I talking about? The the facts. Facts. <laughs> you, you were talking about the fax? Ah, uh, yes, yes. That it was actually, yeah, so it was and the shift. email age, yes, yes. the email age. Yeah, so it was the emails, the fax, and I remember either in, probably in Hayward, as Hans was saying, that Hans was walking around with earphones, and he, the new handphone which has come out, and he was talking, and we were like, what is wrong with him? Why is Hans suddenly talking to himself? Because the handphone, uh, the mobile phone was so new at that point. And then, by the time we reached Helsinki, there was a worry that, we talked about the Y2K bug, that the whole internet system will collapse. Uh, so we, we lived it, that whole exhibition transformed and grew and mutated, uh, reinvented itself through that, those three, four years uh, when we had the dialogue. Uh, second, I'm picking up on the notion of a kind of a dialogue, kind of egalitarianism uh, that the exhibition had. Um, I remember when we started in the exhibition for the session was an optimistic one because it was built on that kind of uh, optimism of the 90s. By the time we reached um, Copenhagen, that optimism had gone. Uh, and in that show, I remember Han Ru and Hans having different themes in different rooms. And one of the themes was called Riot City. And I remember talking to Harry Dono, and because we were involved in the democratic process, we didn't like the word riot. And we approached Hans, we approached Hanru, and we argued for our case, and said that it's not a riot, it is people demonstrating, it is a democratic right to protest and demonstrate. You call it a demonstration city, you can call it a, a protest city, but not a riot city, because a riot city meant that it was the point of view from the people who thought it was a riot, which it wasn't. And there was this dialogue going on, and then we changed the theme, uh, and it became, I think, protest city, right? yes. not yes. riot city. Yes. So there was constant dialogue going on, and uh, the show evolved. And personally, I made like three, four works as, as the show progressed, uh, each time responding to new situations. And it also created a kind of a, uh, a notion of what Hanru was saying that artists were crammed into a small space and they had to confront each other, uh, deal with each other's works. And somewhere along the line, we lost artists. And I re we lost architects, I remember, who threw fits and said that, you know, I'm not going to have my work uh, blocked by some other artists. Uh, so the notion of breaking down the aura, not that it's new, but uh, it took on a new kind of meaning because 10 artists were put together in a small space and you couldn't see the work without seeing other people's work. So it was a new kind of notion of uh, de-orification of an artwork, which for me personally uh, did not exist uh, prior to that. And by de maybe there is a kind of reorification, as uh, Boris Groys I think mentioned about uh, contemporary art. Um, so it was, a, it was an exhibition which uh, made a lot of sense which, because it responded and took on the city as a catalyst, uh, the urban environment as a catalyst for art making. And just to go back to what the, the opening exhibition at Vienna Secession, it was the 100th anniversary and if you Okay, why am I, uh, I'm talking, I'm just, let, let me backtrack. I'm talking so much and thinking so much about this exhibition of late because last year uh, I was asked to write an article uh, or a reflection on cities on the move after 20 years. 
And so I had no choice but to sit down, uh, think through it. I communicated with Hanru uh, about some of the things we talked about, and I sent the text. Uh, I mean, Hanru saw the text, and then Hans also saw the text. And so it's made me think through and reflect on what it meant 20 years later. So that's why I'm saying all these things. For Secession, I just want to, for those of you who have been to the Vienna Secession, just before you enter, above the gates, and is the text, uh, where is it? To each his art, to each art his freedom. And where is it? Uh, yeah. To every age is art, to every art is freedom. And in German it says, der Zeit ihre Kunst, der Kunst ihre Freiheit. Uh, Vienna Secession was the secession of artists from the academy. And 100 years later, I think, uh, Cities on the Move was sort of a secession, was a kind of a rap rebellion by the two curators and the artists against a, a, a very kind of mainstream uh, notion of art making. Uh, and yeah, it's, uh, it was quite a fascinating period. And we had a great time, I think, when both of uh, them came to Kuala Lumpur uh, with their jet lag and Hans was constantly falling asleep because he didn't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they were thrown out of the embassy and Hanru couldn't get into Indonesia because he was... Uh, yeah, I have was, chi Chinese books yeah. in my suitcase. I was so scared because when you get on the plane, you have to fill up a form, ma making sure that you are not uh, bringing any uh, Chinese uh, text, printed Chinese, um, into the country. Uh, it's otherwise you might risk a death penalty. That was, I don't know if you guys remember before 97 was like this. So I get on, actually to get the visa was super complicated yeah, already. I, I tried to apply the visa in Paris. A few times I think you had to. In Paris and then I wait for two months and then they send me to Singapore. And I went to Singapore and, and they sent me uh, back to, no, you should go to China because I have a Chinese passport at the time, and I was resident in France, so theoretically I should get a visa in Paris. And then I have to call friends, and then in, in Indonesia, they sent me a letter signed by the culture minister to invite me as a whatever expert to visit the country. So I had to, the plane was leaving, I, I think at three o'clock or something um, in the afternoon, so at 11 I went, I was still, still waiting at the embassy and with another hour is 12 and the, the guy said, oh, we are having lunch, uh, can you come back? I said, no, I said, I have a letter just arrived now. If you, you make a choice, give me your visa or your job. So he gave me my visa. So I got on the plane um, and then I was, I had to fill up this form, I was so scared that, um, I don't know what will happen to me. Maybe they will never, uh, never let me in. That's okay, but ne never let me out. That would be a little problem. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was um, my first trip to Indonesia, and after that, it was so exciting with all these artists and so on. So that um, anyway. But we kind of split at that time because I went to Japan. And yeah, you went, you went to Japan. And I went, went to, to Indonesia. Jakarta. Yeah, yeah. But what is yeah. interesting is, and I want to come back to that KL, you know. Uh, Singapore moment because we did the two cities together in a way in one week yeah. uh, and there was something which uh, actually Rem Kohlhaas was also instrumental in that research because we obviously had come with him to Hong Kong um, and he had written at that time a lot on Asian cities, his big pearl river delta so Hanru and I felt you know it would be very important to go and see him in Rotterdam uh, and involve him in the project and we waited an entire day at OMA uh, and he was busy uh, and you know there was no meeting, but he said at the end of the day, um, and that was the beginning of a friendship with him ever since. He said, you know, it's anyway a wrong idea that you come here to Rotterdam to talk about Asia. You know, I'm catching a flight tonight to Hong Kong. Join me. So we jumped on a plane, <laughs> uh, changed all our schedule, and went with Rem to Hong Kong. And then we had that dinner in Hong Kong where he really said, in terms of you know, Hanru mentioned to you all these layers, and he added a whole other layer we hadn't thought of because he said there also needs to be a, a layer of history. You can't just look 
at the mutation of Asian cities, but this comes from somewhere, and there is an amnesia about you know, urbanism, and we need to somehow revisit. And he told us a lot about the metabolism as the beginning of our you know, research into metabolism, not only Japanese metabolism, but also uh, Malaysian metabolism and Singaporean metabolism. And you know, there was the idea of visiting uh, William Lim and uh, Tai Liu Kerr in, in, in Singapore. We then, I remember we went together to see Ken Yang. Ken Yang. And there is something I wanted to ask you, Ajahn, to tell us together. We, we had this discussion, I remember, with you also, and with Ram, of course, before going to KL and Singapore, that modernization does not mean westernization, this idea of different forms of modernization, yeah. no? Yeah, I think one of the, the slogans of the 90s in Asia was Asian values, and that was the modern Asian system. Basically, it's a bunch of autocratic leaders saying that we don't need real democracy. Uh, we run it on a modernist model of development, of capitalism, but it is actually very autocratic, uh, you know. So it's, uh, and modernism in Asia then also became a looking back at the past, which was a high, personally, I took it as a problem because when modernism is about looking at the past because you want to rid yourself of the past, or of the, sorry, you want to rid yourself uh, of colonialism, a lot of Asian colonial uh, cities, countries, were colonized. So you look back to a past. So it was a recourse to a past, which became problematic, particularly in politics, uh, because the value system changed. And uh, Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, uh, Mahathir Mohamad, uh, who was the Prime Minister of Malaysia, were the key exponents of this Asian value. And in fact, the Bangkok Declaration in 1993 uh, instituted, inscribed it as a very important uh, notion in Asia. Well, and both of them took it from Japan. So Japan was also a very important player in the notion of an Asian no uh, modernism. Uh, but obviously, it failed. Yeah, I think we, we, we talked quite a bit about those uh, that yeah. looking I mean, back we, into we're the We're still in this kind of um, incredible uh, uh, conflict and confrontation between you know different ideas of uh, what um, contemporary Asian society should be, right? Um, we see, actually we're seeing more and more kind of, you know, totalitarian tendency in politics today. Um, I mean, even Hong Kong now is going through an incredibly moment of uh, political debate of who will be the next guy, right? Um, and so on. Um, and, and it's a global tendency as well, as we see. So, so, um, you know, um, Cities on the Move was really very closely related to the momentum. And it, I think it still remains an inspiration for us to, it's not because we are involved, but really um, we, are, we continue to learn the lesson in the process. Maybe we should uh, bring it to Xu Tan. Um, Xu Tan, we talk about um, in succession, he did actually the, the, the most I'm subtle, uh, <laughs> Uh, in-situ intervention, okay. site-specific. Uh, so uh, my English is uh, really poor, so we have no time to practice it when I live in China. So I would like to use, uh, talk in Cantonese. Huh? Ah, oh yeah. Oh. Uh, Perfect, yeah. Uh, so, uh, the first time we became aware it was 96, uh, and at the time, Hans, Hans and Hao Yu came to Guangzhou. I think it was summer time. Yes, it should be. We have this artist group, Big Tail Elephant. The four of us went to Wang Jun, creator's home, Han Ru and Hans, met with us there at the time was really important it's about the historical situation at the time I'm an artist from China it's hard to say that we could imagine ourselves as Asian artists even today, 
we will call ourselves Chinese artists because we don't really have much to say about other Asian places. I, I don't know who I am either. So this exhibition went way beyond what we thought about Asia or the world. So they brought the concept to us and we were very surprised. It was so new. At the time in mainland China and what was happening in the art scene, we would call our, own, our art avant-garde or modern art. They tell elephant was really not the mainstream because the mainstream was in Beijing. And there are two main directions. One is about traditional uh, revolution or politics, the conflicts and how you feel about the conflicts. The other one is about traditional culture and tradition. We were neither. We lived in places in the PRD, like Guangzhou. How we were feeling was similar to the feeling of City on the Move. Our city is ever-changing, how we lived our lives in such cities. I've participated in two Cities on the Move, and Vienna, that will include Vienna and New York. At the time, there were two exhibitions, City on the Move and Inside Out. It was large-scale exhibition about China. Many Hong Kong artists also went. Very big contrast between the two exhibitions. Inside Out was about Chi mainland Chinese artists in the mainstream. City on the Move was totally different at the time. There were some performances, and I remember at the time, Inside Out, Zhang Huan was responsible. We had someone from Thailand and then one from Indonesia. Yes. Yes. At the time, I thought one exhibition was facing the world, it's about our future, it was on the soft side. And Gao Lu told me, I don't know what the purpose really is, what is trying to be achieved. Well, I can't really answer that question even today. When we arrived at that place, I saw many works already got moved into the space with very high level of density. It's like if you are not watching your step carefully, you may kick something over. So when it comes to art education, we received in mainland China is very different. We thought in a museum, you have a painting, or you, you put it up on this big wall, and you have to keep a distance. But it was so dense. You, you got a lot of this kind of experience in the city, you know. Everything was packed together. That's something very familiar to me. When it comes to art, it may be a bit strange. So it is to lower the status of artist. It's a different kind of experience. The experience you, this is your life, you know. <laughs> you, you, yeah, this kind of that's the feeling. If you see a very um, luxurious museum, and then you see the paintings, 
it doesn't feel familiar. And then I went to the Venice. Zone of urgency. Zone of urgency. I feel the same. Strong experience. I, I mean, as a Chinese artist, I, I feel not strange. I like it. Uh, uh, the curators give me a lot of the, um, suggestion. Pressure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One of my pieces with the glimpse of the mirror. Yeah, was on the Klimt mural. When I entered the room, I was afraid to do anything. Because I have been worshipping that Chinese artist or icon for a long time. Books for many years. So now put me here. <laughs> you kill me, huh? <laughs> yeah, you want to kill me. So uh, the staffs come say, "Oh, uh, uh, you can see." On the photo, you can see the cabinet. You can see the cabinet with a Klimt drawing sketch when he was uh, sketching about the mural. He said, "What the curator said." We should remove it. So the cabinet was moved away. I said, keep it here, please don't move it. So all my melons work were kept around that cabinet space. We had to allow people to see the mural in the room, so it was brightly lit. Slight projection. But I wanted slight projection so as not to distort the paintings. Hans said the well, projector can be put towards the wall. And I thought that was a very good idea. And then I noticed something very important. When you enter, well, I think most were white people, Europeans. Actually, they come not for my work. They come for the Klimt, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a very good idea. You put, you put the sketch of the uh, drawing sketch there. That's very good because people know <laughs> they, they will see something. <laughs> and you can see that I think that all of these people are very good. Westerners are very radical in my mind. A lady brought along a young man to look at the Klimt work. I think that's why they came. My works are very nasty and dirty looking. The kids, my eyes. Go, 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 let's go. Immediately they left. And that was a big blow to me. The world isn't like what China imagined. Another gossip during the opening. A man dashed forward to one piece created by an Indonesian artist and he kicked the piece and destroyed the piece. Haru was very angry and he rushed forward and they started a fight. Do you remember? I don't know what happened. <laughs> so, um, and Wang Dao's piece from magazine. Uh, he wanted to do many, many pieces to be shown everywhere. And then Hanru sat down with him seriously and said, well, your work, we may have to cancel many of your works because many staff in the museum, they are feminists. They hate the sculptures. So it can't be done. So how about in the elevator? It's really horrible, you know. In night, the, the, the um, elevator, uh, how to say, elevator. Now it open. You can see a, a, a person stand there with this. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah, so I feel that's really strange. For I mean, Wang Wang Du Wang Du, that time still has a. Wang Du at the time had very strong Chinese background as an artist. So there were many issues. And then for Han Ru, encouraged me to place my works all over the place. One was right at the entrance. It was a durian. Actually, it's a speaker, and then it's a young girl from Beijing telling her story about her parents, their relationship, and her own relationship mixed with a lot of politics. So it's there for um, 24 hours, and she kept talking and talking. I was happy. My work right by the road, and then the next day it was gone. There's a park next door with very beautiful sculptures, um, Renaissance style sculptures. I was rather upset. And then the museum told me the cleaner did it. So I got it back from the park. It was gone again the next day. And I realized, art is not what we imagine. If you're in the Western country, you can place art anywhere you want. Maybe because I'm a, not a very good artist, people didn't want my work there by the entrance. If it's Picasso's work, no problem. So this exhibition impacted on me a lot. For someone who came from mainland China, from Asia, it was really way beyond what I thought about politics. And about art, the imagination. That's all from me. Thank you. Before we turn to uh, um, Anthony, I would want to add two things. Uh, according to this, one is actually cities on the move. Always use the the city where the artists live or work as um, the uh, location. We never mention the nationality in all the information, all the communications. So if you look at the catalog, it's Xu Tan, Xu Tan living in Guangzhou, or um, Ellen living in Hong Kong, and so on. You never have the nationality. This is something we did it on purpose. It was really important to say that city, at the time, you know, even today, is even more important. City is a hope, it's a way that uh, for us to imagine a new world beyond the logic of uh, nation state, um, beyond the politically correct identity. This is really important. And the second thing is actually Cities on the Move is a global exhibition, global project that continues to produce new locations, meaning that um, not only each step is a different uh, structure, but also it produces a new community every time. We have this artist something like 50 or 60 traveling with the show during the three years, like a big family. Every six months we met somewhere. And also we include local participations. That generates every time a new community. So that it's somehow a laboratory of how to make a new nation, new, I would not say nation, but a, a human community um, along the way. No, that's uh, super important because, yeah. of course, the idea of, you know, polyphony uh, of centers, because we were very uh, convinced that the exhibition could somehow create an awareness for this amazing polyphony of centers that was in, in Asia, of which uh, there was very little awareness, you know, in, in Europe uh, at the time. And, of course, also a truly cosmopolitan idea of generating dialogue between the cities. The exhibition, very often we observed also there weren't actually that many dialogues going on between these different Asian cities. Um, and we wanted to kind of stimulate dialogue, dialogue between the artists run spaces, between the artists. So, you know, this was exchanged. It became a sort of whole exhibition as a mechanism also for triggering more exchange. So it was much more than what you see here. What you see here are these different stations 
Uh, but what happened in between, you know, as Andrew said, you know, it didn't stop. And what happened in between were lots of, you know, collaborations, friendships, dialogues, exchange between different cities, which had started. I want to, before we then continue with, with Anthony and the, uh, a new perspective on, uh, on Cities on the Move, ask one question to Zutan, because for me, what happened in Guangzhou was uh, a miracle, a total miracle, because I had no knowledge you know, about that art scene. I knew a little bit about Beijing and Shanghai and had read, but I was uh, you know, living uh, in Europe completely ignorant. And here we arrived with Wuhan Ru, and Wuhan Ru kept telling me on the way, you know, we'd be so surprised. It's one of the great art centers in the world. You will see the most amazing art scene. And here we arrive and encounter in one evening uh, an amazing history, and of course, encounter you but also your colleagues, no? And I think it was that incredible gathering where we had all the members of the big elephant group, you know, in a room. And I think it would be great to hear a little bit from you what really happened, because it was, you know, it's it's the Guangzhou miracle. What what really happened? It would be great to hear you talk a little bit about the big third elephant group. Also, some of the members are no longer with us, so I think it's important, you know, to remember that. Absolutely. We just had the show, actually, the second step of the big tail elephant show in OC18 in Beijing after times in uh, the show in times in Guangzhou, but just, yeah. Yeah, 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 not just time. Yeah, the, the group was, uh, the group was, uh, you know, how to say, started on, uh, in the beginning of ni uh, 90s, yeah, 1990. 1990, 1990, yeah. Yeah, the, uh, the time you came, we, we how to say, do cooperative work almost for six and, six and seven years. Uh, <laughs> and was there a manifesto, or what brought the group together? What? I think. Just that, uh, the like who I said at the beginning. Uh, I mean, in the middle of the nineties, there is a Hong Kong Institute, the sociology, uh, a local university had sociology studies and they researched into big tail elephant. At the time, there were many organizations in Hong Kong who were concerned about the situation in mainland China. There was another plan about relationship studies in Dongguan. There were many hair salons. And there was a report. A professor was responsible. I think his last name was Yun. He felt Big Tail Elephant was a civil society. So we were very democratic inside this society without clear leadership. If we were to run an exhibition, we would automatically work together while respecting each other, and the collaborations would be very tight. So Hong came back and told us a lot about what's happening in the rest of Asia and in the rest of the world. Many imaginations. At the time, what was really special was it compared to the traditional Chinese political organizations and culture, things were very different. Every single person was free. Our directions were very similar. If you can't agree with the other people in your team, there's a lot of problem. But in our team, there was a lot of mutual respect. Just like what you said, we had many similar art groups starting like that. And every artist is different. But the direction was very similar. That's the Guangzhou style, isn't it? The Southern China style. 
Are you talking about nationalism now? Well, in Beijing and other northern places, there were other art groups, but they were a bit different. If they run a project, they will have one manifesto, one program, one guiding principle, and the same action will be taken. But for Big Toe Elephant, we were exactly the other way around. So Big Toe Elephant is not Falun Gong. In our group, we had a close friend who was a member of Falun Gong. And that person kept saying, you should all join Falun Gong. And it was a lady. We respected her a lot. But we have different beliefs. I just can't help it. Since she was so concerned about us, we should accept her. But... While we were very democratic, when it comes to very important matters or decisions, we can veto it with one vote. If one person says no, that means no. So from the very beginning, we set that structure or system. So the lady could not join Big Tail Elephant, a very famous performance artist at the time. Thank you very much. I feel very difficult to talk because after, first of all, I'm the only person on this panel who hasn't seen the show. Good. <laughs> and uh, after after the artists and the curators talk about it, it's uh, very exciting, but it's also very difficult for me to talk. Uh, and and uh, of course, I uh, thank you to Haru and uh, Hasrik for inviting me. And I'm here mainly because uh, I, uh, on behalf of Asia Art Archive, have been working with uh, an archive of the exhibition uh, Cities on the Move since about two three years. Uh, so uh, Hanyu has very generously donated a lot of materials about the exhibition to us, uh, including a lot of amazing photos, uh, which you see some of them here. And it's also very special and difficult to, to work on this uh, archive, because usually when you work on the archive of the exhibition, you have installation shots, uh, photographs, stuff like that. When you write a caption, maybe there's one work, two works, maximum three works, but for the photos of cities on the move, as you can see, there may be 20 works in the, in the, in the photo. So when you have to write the caption, it's impossible because you have, can't figure out the, uh, how to describe the photograph. I think it's a, it's a general uh, challenge about the exhibition uh, uh, at that time also. Um, Actually, that one with Huang Yongping and Cai Guoqiang, um, there's a work by uh, Hoi Chao as well, Hoi just yeah. next to it, the, the yeah. tables, for yeah. example. Yeah. So, uh, but obviously it's very important and uh, our purpose is to organize the archive and uh, make them accessible in the future for research because the show obviously has a lot of implications and inspirations for today. Um, and one of the most interesting things to do about the archive is uh, going through all the reviews uh, of the shows at that time. So, uh, for example, I have printed out some of them and um, and of course, the most interesting ones are the ones with the bad criticism, like this one, called Eastern Promise Turns to Nightmare. <laughs> Published on Financial Times uh, during the Haywood version of the exhibition. And uh, very interesting because, no, seriously, uh, because you can see um, uh, the conflicting factors and the dynamic factors of the exhibition as mentioned by the critics of that time. And the critic of course, and that's the irony, is yeah. Ralph Rugoff, who now runs the Haver. Oh really? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. This is why he got a job. <laughs> Don't have him rough. I, I see, it. I see, I see. So, um, but in general, one can uh, summarize the kind of criticism about the exhibition to be, uh, the first thing is about is chaos. The, cha the chaotic situation that uh, uh, is a lot of criticism about uh, 
uh, the architectural elements of the exhibition. So, for example, the Hayward version was designed by Ram Kohaus and Oli Sharon. Uh, and uh, the critics would think that uh, the architectural uh, involvement did not really help the audience to engage with the artworks, but rather hinder them by seeing them. It does not help the people to see the artworks, but that's not the point. So um, that's, the, that's the first thing. And the second thing is um, they think that it represents a kind of new exoticism of the image of the 21st century Asia. So uh, the things that say things are very inaccessible and things that's maybe ugly or, or uh, it's a, a little bit like tourist exotic system and things like that. So, um, well, I think it's very interesting because uh, first of all, um, this is exactly the point uh, of, of the curators to create an exhibition uh, to be so unconventional. So no artworks can be seen, like Haru has said uh, a few times. Uh, no artworks can be seen in, uh, in isolation. All the artworks have to negotiate with one another. It's very performative. Uh, and uh, Hans Juric has said uh, in, the, in the introduction essay that uh, the exhibition itself is not a rep representation of the city. It functions like a city itself. Yeah. So it's not a picture of the city. It's the nature of the city the, the exhibition is talking about. So I think this is um, the most radical and also the most uh, innovative idea about the exhibition, which is very influential to exhibition making um, afterwards. And um, the things about exoticism and uh, kitschness uh, it's very interesting because most people have recognized it as an important visual element. The kitsch is an important visual element of the exhibition. Like this article called East Endless, published in Time Out London, uh, described that, and I quote, the ironic orgy of self-congratulatory kitsch is one of the high points of the show. So I think it's a... Although it's time out, but it's a, it's a, it's a perfect statement, huh? Yeah. It's uh, perfect for time out. It's, it's perfect for time out. out. It's perfect for time out. Uh, well, I think it's right, but also I think, uh, and uh, to see from uh, today's perspective, it's very important to recognize uh, a period of time in artistic practices in Asia, especially in the 1990s, uh, I think was a time where a lot of artists started to uh, really, instead of avoid uh, they face directly uh, the everyday visual resources that they have living in, say, for example, in Guangzhou, in KL, uh, or in, in, uh, in Singapore, Indonesia. Uh, they start to face this kind of visual resources because that's their re everyday reality. The quiche, the bad taste, or the very strange hybridity of visual languages is the things that they see every day. So, uh, rather than maybe in the 80s or 70s, they would make art and learn art from, from books, from art histories, or from imagination, uh, people started to really use the everyday Im imaginary. I think uh, Big Tail Elephant Art Group is uh, one of the most important, uh, Hai Chang also, uh, including Alan, and also, uh, say for example, um, uh, Zhang Guo with the Yang Zhang youth and using things. And uh, also we have Chei Zhong Wa, for example. You have Chei Zhong Wa, and then uh, with the project of Love and, and Wicklid, uh, making a um, Thai style Surasi. Mo yeah, movie yeah. poster, Surasi. Um, Navin. And, yeah. yeah, I think it's a very important tendency that was starting to begin at that time. And it's, it's very challenging and maybe a, even a little bit offensive for the, for the European audience at that time because it's uh, something that is, uh, if you don't have the context, if you don't think in this um, dimension, it can be quite ugly and it can be quite uh, disturbing to see things like that. So I think it's very important. Uh, another thing that I think is very, very crucial to uh, cities on the move and the general practice of uh, Hanru and Hans Jewich is the idea of self-organization. Not many people have recognized the, the, the importance of the idea of self-organization in this show because also about Asia, in Hong Kong, in uh, China, and also in Southeast Asia, um, in the 90s, it was a very important period of time for artists 
to uh, really develop the spirit of self-organization uh, because the lack of uh, infrastructure at that time. So we have Ellen, Video Taj in Hong Kong, we have Parasite, and then we have a lot of uh, like a Big Tail Elephant Art Group. They organize all their exhibition themselves instead of going to the museum. Um, we have Liberia Brez in Guangzhou. We have many, many examples in Asia. It's amazing uh, artist one space. Just because there were no museums that supported contemporary art in Asia. And so also in Hong Kong, I mean, still, um, it's still very important. Part of it's still the, very important. The landscape. Yeah, including this influence myself because I grew up in Hong Kong and also work in the World Power River Delta. And I think self organization is still the most important thing about uh, in the art and ecology. So I think Han Ru and Han Surik, um, uh, one of their major, major uh, curatorial contributions or curatorial uh, mission is that to bring this kind of self-organization, this kind of uncertainty, this kind of uh, dilemmaism into a traditional museum setting like Hayward Gallery or things like that. Hayward Gallery is already quite progressive in terms of uh, keeping the special architectural design. But it's still quite challenging for for, um, for organization, for institution in, in the West, especially. So this kind of uh, conflict, and, uh, I think, is, is very important. And also, it helps to be real or vitalize uh, exhibition making and also museum practice. So I think these things, if we see the exhibition today or do research, if we can do an archaeology of exhibitions that with the aim of that, I think it's a very important and very interesting research topic. Okay, thank you. Should we, we have another nine minutes, 38 seconds? So, so we should uh, open it up. Right? Yeah, so you guys have something to say, maybe throw eggs or something, but <laughs> it would be great. Yes, please. Just one second, uh, we need a mic. Do we, do we need a mic? Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, the, all this is totally, uh, totally fascinating and exciting. It's good you have been together to talk about different perspectives in the exhibition. Uh, you have been uh, mentioning, Hans has been uh, mentioning uh, Taz uh, Akimbe uh, at the time. Uh, you have been also talking about a very specific period, uh, which is a mutation period, uh, where uh, cities like Hong Kong were uh, actually totally uh, in complete metamorphosis. Uh, what I, and you mentioned also a third thing, which is uh, the mutation between fax to internet. And uh, I have the feeling that all these things go together to create the very specificity of the exhibition. So my question is, uh, what a Citizen the Move 2018 would look like? Right. Well, <laughs> I didn't say it was easy. <laughs> yeah, Maurice also always about the future, right? <laughs> yeah, great. Um, uh, I think, uh, Hans, Hans, maybe you correct me um, if I say anything wrong. I think um, the relevance of um, cities on the move in, um, in our time, it's not only because it's a kind of archaeological case study, and it was, I think it's uh, only a beginning of something, that this beginning is still going on, and I really hope that I can only hope uh, that this would help us to rethink all the, all the technology, all the money, all the investment today we have in our world uh, can be used to provoke an even more radical uh, action, uh, somehow uh, uh, bringing back uh, perhaps, you know, uh, in. 2018, Cities on the Move would be happening exactly as you said, the, the, zone, uh, the temporary autonomous zones, uh, generating this kind of zones in different spots of the city um, that created a, a regular or, I don't know, irregular kind of insurgency everywhere. Um, hopefully this spirit can still uh, be brought into all kind of um, establishments um, to transform them into a 
uh, from a more or less kind of um, uh, similar structures into different structures and different possibilities of coexistence of uh, diversity. So I think that, I don't know if it's a necessity to redo a cities on the move, but really to make cities on the move into a way of living of the art community and also of this urban community somehow. So I don't know if this is an answer, but... No, it's a, it's a great answer, and of course, also, you know, we actually officially never declared Cities on the Move to be over. So, you know, this panel is an incarnation of Cities on the Move, and, you know, talking with Wuhan Ru about the book, because we never really did the book, with the exception of, you know, this uh, strange photocopied night train document. So there is, you know, still the missing book, and so for us, the show has just, you know, moves across waves with intervals and pauses and sciences, uh, but the project is not, you know, is not over, can be reactivated at all times. These are, and I think, of course, I mean, there is a methodology, I think, involved. There are certain things at that time which are necessary, which maybe today would need a different necessity or do ask for a different necessity. I think it is extraordinary that there were, and there is this amazing generation of artists of whom we have three great artists, great, great artists with us today, and of whom we had, you know, a hundred of great, great artists, more than a hundred in the exhibition, and it is... Uh, extraordinary for the, for most basically all of these artists. It was actually the first exhibition in in Europe, and uh, so it had a lot to do also with you know uh, giving a visibility to artists. And I mean, it, there are many many artists we could talk about. Simran Gill, for example, whom we saw time in Singapore, who developed such a uh, you know an amazing practice, or Lee Bull, you know, in Korea. So many of these artists, you know, emerged, you know, through uh, this uh, uh, through this exhibition. Yuta Kasone, whom you know we saw in Tokyo in our research, which just had started and was, you know, and was emerging. And I think, in a way, to make an exhibition a platform for artists to emerge. And I think, you know, the methodology is to be open, to be curious, to be generous, to be radical. That methodology continues. We also believe, of course, that it's important that you know to not isolate art. So and I think. That's something which, you know, and I think Anthony touched upon this, with the, 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 the difficult relationship between art and architecture, which confused a lot of people, but which I still believe is always worthwhile exploring, you know, because Vasari said there is no separation, art and architecture for, for him, you know, were together. And I mean, it was a very astonishing situation when all of a sudden in Vienna, uh, and in Vienna we had, you know, uh, approximately 50 of the artists came, and all of a sudden, you know, you would have uh, Simbring Gill from Singapore, but you would also have William Lim and Liu Tai Kao. Totally different worlds, you know, in the same room. Or you would have, uh, you know, uh, Lee Bull from Seoul, but then you would have Jinai Kim, the urbanist. And, you know, many of these people had never met each other in their own city. So it was also, and of course, the architects were highly confused because yeah. they got there's invited a, to an there's exhibition. There's a name for this section called the Torture Chamber of Architecture. <laughs> exactly, they were super confused because they thought this is an architecture show and that we were architecture curators, so they sent us models. So when, you know, I remember Toyo Ito came to, to, to Vienna and he took me aside and he said, you know, I thought this is an architecture show. I'm not going to send a model ever again. So then for the next incarnations of Cities on the Move, he sent us rings into which people could go, you know, immersive environments. So in a way, you know, it had a lot to do with this learning process also and, and, and of course, of these worlds bringing together. And I think that that's something which continues to be highly relevant. And also, uh, what is maybe relevant is that it's a journey into the unknown. Hanru and I didn't know where we went. We went with all of these artists on a journey, and we followed the artists. That's, you know, it's the great example you gave with the riot, you know. Uh, the great ex example also of Ellen, you know, criticizing the title. We listen to artists. To listen to artists is always key. And then you never know where you reach when you follow artists. You know, in other occasions, uh, I, you know, follow Philip Areno, and we ended up doing an opera where, you know, artists uh, became a time-based exhibition. So, so, I mean, that is an answer also to your question. We just don't know what's going to happen next, but the methodology, you know, remains. Yeah. I think there one thing the artists may, uh, may uh, agree with me or not uh, is that if we do uh, Cities on the Move today, I think many artists would not want to join us anymore because we cannot afford to pay the insurance of their work. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have more questions? I think we can take two more questions. Yes. 
going to the um, the topic of catch that was um, spoken about by Anthony at the end. Could um, the artist maybe speak to whether that notion of kitsch was self-conscious as some kind of an expression of um, of themselves or whether it was just an intuitive uh, moment in time that's now easily seen with 20 years of hindsight? Yeah, uh, I think kitsch, it was so prevalent. It was what you saw every day on the streets uh, in a lot of Asian cities. Uh, though, as True Tan had said, Artists weren't using oil paint. They weren't use, They couldn't. They weren't rich enough at that point to use video. Um, they couldn't do sculpture. So you use what you saw and what you had in front of you, and cheaply. Uh, Surasi had a one dollar sale because, you know, now you have one dollar shops or one pound shops, uh, but objects were so cheap. So you use what you had, and they were often bright, colorful. Uh, kitschy plastic elements in, in, in the society around us. And so I don't think it was self-conscious, but it was a sense of acknowledging that it exists, a sense of using what you have and the city as a base for your, as your, as a catalyst for your work. Yeah. That's how I feel about it. Yeah, I think that if I could add one thing, and actually the, dif the difference between kitsch and high art no longer apply in this context. I think we need a whole set of new so-called aesthetic uh, theory or thinking or value system to measure what we are doing. And, and I think that maybe our history is always about um, subversion, Subver subversion of all the established canons. And, and that sounds very modernist, but still, I think this um, um, still, you know, it's something uh, essential to um, to creativity itself. So I think uh, we have to face this question. We don't have a set answer, but I think really we have to face the question of, you know, um, the canon. Yeah. Uh, I just I wanted to say the Citizen Louvre just happened in 1997. I think that's a really important change point of not just the culture but also political and society of the social uh, issue, the change point in Asia. So I think the exhibition is impossible to be repeated. Yeah, I think. Um, I don't think we can make the same thing t today. Yeah, this is my idea, yeah. I think the world is actually, I mean, if you're talking about Kish, I think people are um, getting used to it and or actually numb by it. So the, um, now you are, I mean, our attention span and also our uh, aesthetics in looking into pictures has been evolved into a more complex um, complex way of looking at things. Um, we are, I think, I don't know about the Western, the Western evo evolution, but I mean, in Hong Kong, I think we are more complex as getting more and more complex, uh, not only layers, but um, well, I think the world is getting more complex in a way. I think there's also something really important that a sense of humor, irony, and I think that the most powerful critique of political um, or aesthetic or whatever canon, it's distance and, and irony. I think cities on the move and many things that we learn from artists living in Asia at the time, even today, it's really, their work is systematically um, risking yeah. with, you know, being a, a part of the object of irony and in the meantime it generate, it produce irony about the society, about, you know, all kind of uh, received ideas. 
So that is really something uh, important. And the informal, the ironic, the uncertain is always the power. And not being politically correct. I think Absolutely. there was a sense of, uh, for me again, in the exhibition about constantly challenging political correctness uh, yeah. <laughs> along the way. And it turned off a lot of people from critics to museum curators and all. Maybe we can take one last question. If not, I had a last question actually to Ellen I wanted to ask you before, which is, you know, it came to my mind because of video thought and the kind of word video, and then in relation came back to my mind with your question, you know, what would it mean to do an exhibition now, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, because, you know, we discussed today also how the exhibition kind of accompanied uh, or was sort of having as a parallel sort of, you know, development, the transition from the fax age to the email age, how it was the sort of beginning of the mobile phones and people thinking we would sort of talk to ourselves mm -hmm. when we have first mobile phones. Now obviously, you know, today an exhibition like Cities on the Move would also be a negotiation, I suppose, between, you know, um, what is there and then between VR and maybe even AR, what would it mean to bring augmented reality, you know, in the context of uh, a performative space of a city. So I want to ask Ellen, because you've pioneered, you know, media, video task to maybe comment on that. I, I, I totally agree that uh, we are doing the show or presenting the show again, it will be, probably people would be we're, uh, going into the virtual space, like the AR thing. Like, you know, there are layers of image coming in, you can push it away or you can bring it in. So it will be more interactive with images. But, um, but then I really appreciate the old way of presenting the city on the moves. I mean, as how Hong Yu have said, I mean, the irony and also the, the you know, fighting of space and all that uh, contradicting ideas appearing in front of you that you cannot, uh, as an audience, you cannot control the images. It's more, um, if the, the show a lot of character and a, a lot of, um, Provocation, and um, that is the thing that AR cannot be, be, you know, cannot fulfill. I think there could not be a better conclusion. We are immensely grateful to our great speakers and to you all, of course, uh, for being here so so early. Thank you all very much.